Luke chapter 16, if you have your Bible, I feel a little better than I have probably the last three months uh, uh, concerning even my mind and my train of thought. So I really believe that God's been pretty much doing a, a good thing in my mind and also in my personal body here, amen, uh, uh, pretty much with my liver and everything. So praise the Lord. I, I started to feel old school again. Praise God, man. So uh, just uh, bear with me, and we're going to get into the Word of God. Uh, I so thank Pastor Campbell, Connie. I uh, also want to thank uh, Pastor Tozer. Uh, I'm telling you, uh, since I came over here, not only Pastor Tozer, but also Heath Coda and uh, Pastor Bobby Hedegaard. Uh, uh, I'm surrounded by three great men in our church that uh, we all have our strength and our weaknesses. And I really believe that God has put each and one of us, amen, in our strength, amen, in the Chandler Church. So, praise God. We're going to see Flaming Revival. Praise God, amen. So, uh, let's look at Luke chapter 16. Uh, the other day, I got a phone call from one of my cousins. And uh, this cousin I grew up with right here in the Southside Chandler, Arizona. Uh, pretty much he was raised by my grandmother. My grandmother was a Christian and uh, old Oscar, man, never was a young man when he grew up, was a troublemaker. He, uh, my grandmother pretty much had him under his wing and my grandfather and uh, pretty much uh, he had everything that he wanted, amen, uh, back in those days. Uh, hadn't seen him for many, many years. When I got sick with my liver, all of a sudden, uh, I got a phone call from Oscar. And he says, I heard you're pretty much sick. And I began to describe and tell him, man, what was happening in my own personal life of what was going on. And so we talked as I haven't seen him for about at least 40 some years. And he got a hold of me. When he got a hold of me. And that was probably about two and a half years ago, and I uh, lost contact with him. I did have his number, and uh, he took my number down, and just the other day, he called me again that not only just called me, but God really convicted me because here is Oscar, a sinner, wanting to know how I was doing. How many know there are so many opportunities right in front of us? And we go on talking and old Oscar says, I called you because I got something in mind. He says, uh, we have a big family, just my family's, you know, 36 and we have a great coming that's going to be number 37. But I begin to pretty much guess how much is in the Martinez family? their family combined together. I came up close to about at least 600 of us. No doubt we're a family of multiplication. <laughs> but he makes this statement, he says, I called you because I want to do this big event on a family reunion. And he tells me, are you in? And I said, sure, I mean, just give me the dates and let me know and let me look at the calendar and uh, I'll try to pretty much uh, rile up the, the clan on my side and we can have a pretty much great family reunion. And when he hung up, I began to say, what a great opportunity that sits right in front of me. And yet it took a sinner to call me for this opportunity. And I begin to ponder this and the sermon that I'm going to read is a rich man that had all the opportunity in the world right in front of him, right in front of his gate. Yet he loses the opportunity with his man. I want to look at a sermon that entitled Miss Opportunity. No doubt we all have opportunities. How many know in life that's all it's all about is opportunities. Opportunities to have a better job, 
Opportunities, if you're single in there, that one day you're going to get married. Opportunities in your job. There's opportunities when we come to funerals to be pretty much a testimony, to witness. Opportunities in family gatherings. Opportunities even to witness right at your job site. Co-workers. And we can go on and on in all the opportunities that God puts right in front of you and I. And if we're not careful, it's so easy to miss the opportunity on people right in front of us for God to reach. Let's look at missed opportunity because this man had probably one of the greatest opportunities in the Bible and God puts him right in front of him. And yet, he misses it. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. Now, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared very good, rich. And the Bible says that every day, he fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who lay at his gate. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sword. They had more compassion. One put that in. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and being tormented in Hades. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, you remember that in your lifetime you receive your good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot. Nor cannot those from there pass to us. And then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you should send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, they have Moses, they have the door church, they got the potter's house. Yeah. Let them hear them. Then he goes on to say, but he said to them, if you, they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they, that they be persuaded the one raised from the dead. Let's look at missed opportunities. Because this rich man had one of the best opportunities to rescue Lazarus, who only hoped he meant to eat what fell from the rich man's table, the Bible says. This man has no love or even no compassion or even to help Lazarus, who was begging at the door. You know, I made a study made on the word Lazarus. Why did God call? Because I may know God names everyone in here tonight. And I look at the name Lazarus, or I looked it up, amen. And why did Christ refer to this poor beggar as Lazarus? The meaning of his name tonight is assistance of God. He was an assistance of God laying right outside of this gate. Not only that, he names him this other name, who God helps or who God wants to help. No doubt this man, amen, is right in front of the gate, amen, and God puts him there, amen, for one reason and one particular reason is for him to help Lazarus. Because how many know God is the one that's going to help you and I tonight. Or God has helped you and I. And right in front of the rich man's gate is Lazarus. 
who God's name and who God helps. But yet this rich man will not help him. <coughs> Heaven and hell is laying right there in front of his gate. No doubt I believe this rich man, you do a study on him, had a Pharisee mindset, mentality. Bible says that he despised Lazarus as he's outside of the gate. No doubt that's what a Pharisee mentality does. How many know that? We also see this in the book of Luke chapter 18 verse 10 and 13. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One Pharisee, uh, one Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, an extortioner, unjust, an adulterer, or even as this tax collector that's praying there. And the tax collector himself begins to pray, standing afar off with not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. No doubt we know about the Pharisees again when they try to even stone the woman that was caught in adultery. And Jesus comes to the scene, and when he comes to the scene, amen, he rescues her. I mean, God is all about rescuing the people and the sinner. And he says, amen, how about, amen, each and one of you in here, if you have no sin, then you cast the first stone. No doubt God comes in the scene. Jesus comes in the scene. He rescues her and he goes, go on your way and sin no more. Missed opportunities are right in front of us every day. Just like Lazarus. And not only Lazarus, we can go through the whole Bible in the New Testament. The woman at the well, God comes in the sea and rescues her. Not only the woman in the well, how about the woman with the issue of blood uh, for 12 years? God helps her, sets her free, and she goes on her way not to be a castaway anymore. Let's look at it. Reaching out to the living, because I believe that's what the church is called, is to reach out to those that need help in here. Now we see the rich man in verse number 27. He wants to reach out all of a sudden to the, to the lost, but how I many know he misses his opportunity? And now he's in a place of torment. Now he wants to do the will of God. Now he wants to outreach. Now he wants to reach his five brothers. And in verse 27, then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Now we see the rich man trying to reach out to others, but it's too late, amen. Now he feels himself lost. Now, amen, he doesn't have anything from one day to the next. He's a lost man. And because he's a lost man, he has missed an opportunity that God has put in front of him. I really believe, amen, that this man was religious because he makes that statement, testify, have somebody testify and go reach out to them. But God, Jesus tells him, no, you missed the opportunity. When you had the opportunity, you should have done it. Have you ever felt, amen, that you could have done better with someone in here? But the opportunity never came back. No doubt, even as a Christian, for the last 30 years, uh, I've been to the test on opportunity, on witnessing to people, reaching out to them. But, amen, inside of me, something would always sometimes hold me back. And when they would leave and go far off, amen, I lost the opportunity. 
never to witness and to touch that person again. No doubt we all have done that as a Christian here. I was reading a, a book. How many old children or our children or even teenagers, amen? It's so, if, if we're, we're not careful or if you're not careful, it's so easy that you can miss the opportunity that you have your family and your mom and your dad here praying for you. Because time passes real quick. How many know that? I read a story, D.L. Moody. If I can uh, open it up, I want to read this story. It was about a young man that lost opportunity with his mom and his dad. Mom and dad were saved. They loved God. They were in the meeting with D.L. Moody. And there in the midst was a young, their young son, young boy at the age of 10 years old goes on to say, one night in Chicago at the close of a meeting in the YMCA rooms, a young man sprang to his feet and said, Mr. Moody, would you let me speak a few words? I said, certainly. Then for about five minutes, he pleaded with those men to break from sin. He's talking about the young kid. And he said, amen, if you have anyone who takes any interest in your spiritual warfare, warfare, treat them kindly, for they are the best friends you have. I was on a, I was the only, I was an only child, and my mother and father took great interest in me. Every morning at the family altar, father used to pray for me, and every night he would commend me to God. Uh, I was wild and reckless and didn't like the restraint of home. When my father died, my mother took up the family worship. Many a time she came to me and said, Oh, my boy, Mijito, if you, was, if you would stay to family worship, I would be the happiest mother on earth. But when I pray, you do, uh, uh, on earth. But when I pray, she says, you don't even stay in the house. Sometimes I would go at midnight, he says, from a night of partying and hear my mother praying for me. Sometimes in the small hours of morning, I heard her voice pleading for me. At last, at last I felt that I must either become a Christian or leave home. And one day I gathered a few things together and stole away from home without letting even my mother know. Sometime after I heard indirectly that my mother was ill, ah, I thought, it is my conduct, my conduct, conduct that is making her ill. My first impulse was to go home and cheer her, cheer her last days. But the thought, thought came, came that if I did, I should have to become a Christian. My proud, my proud heart revolted and said, no, I will not become a Christian. Months rolled by and, and at last I, he heard again that his mother was worse. Then he thought, if my mother should not live, I would never forgive myself. That thought took him home. And he reached the old village about dark and started on foot for the home, which was about a mile and a half distant. And on the way, he passed the graveyard and he thought he would go to his father's grave to see if there was a newly made grave beside it. And as he drew near the spot, his heart began to beat faster. And when he came near enough, the light of the moon shone and a newly made grave with a great deal of emotion, he said, young man, for the first time in my life, this question came over me, who is going to pray for my lost soul now? Father is gone and mother is gone and they are the only two who ever cared for me. If I could have called my mother back that night and heard her breath, 
my name in prayer or breathe my name in prayer, I would have given the world if it had been mine to give. I spent all that night by her grave and God, for Christ's sake, heard my mom's prayer and in that grave, I became a child of God. But listen to what he says. But I never forgave myself for the way I treated my mother and probably never will. Miss opportunities. Children in here, teenagers, don't miss the opportunity when your parents are here in church. Because life is but a vapor. They're here today, we're here today, and so easily be gone tomorrow. Now, I thought about this young kid, and I thought about James Jr. And you know, when you're studying everything, things just, you know, God, you know, begins to penetrate your heart. And no doubt a lot of you know that, uh, I've been working on a 65 in Pella. I heard some remarks, but you know, oh well, God is good. But there's a story behind that in Pella that I've been building. James Jr., when he was 18 years old, his grandma gave him about 7,000 to fix an Impala. It needed a little bit of work, and my kids and my, uh, uh, his sisters and his brother would tell him that he was every day out there trying to fix the Impala. He would sand it. His, he, had a, he had a dream for that car. He was going to paint it. He was going to fix it up and everything. And James began to go a little even to, you know, uh, the party and everything. So he pretty much abandoned the car, thinking that Grandma probably wasn't going to try to get her money back. One day when he came back, the Impala was gone. And the brothers and the sisters said that when he didn't see the car out there, it crushed his heart. This is why I began to build that car and having little memories of James Jr. Pretty much down the road, I'm going to pass it on to the kids, one of the kids. I'm not going to say who it is, but stay those ears. He might go right away and text. <laughs> Addie's in here, too. But anyways, uh, no problem with me fixing or the memories that I had with him. I had great memories with James. I mentioned this before that two weeks before he was going to pass away, me and him got it right. And he began to make this, these statements to me. He said, Dad, all I wanted was just 15 minutes of your time. I have missed all, I missed all those opportunities to make. I mean, because us as parents, we could be guilty as even the teenagers. We got it together. We got it right. I began to weep. He began to weep. I still remember the 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 the, the, the bike we were at, the intersection where we were at. I remember I made a, a left, and and I said, "Don't worry about it, son. Things are going to get better for me and you. I'm going to make it all up to you." And the reason why I said that is because I missed so much opportunity. With my son. Now you can say that's all fine and dandy, Pastor. I'm glad you got it right, but you know what really eats me up? Is because I don't even know where he's at today. James Jr. wasn't living right at the at the time. He had a girlfriend living uh, uh, with this girl, with his girlfriend. Living with some guy that was pretty much bad influence, and I told him pretty much stay away from him. <coughs> Didn't listen. <coughs> and yet when he opens this door, looking for the other guy, 
and he has no clue because he has a, a TV box that he had just bought his fiance. And when he opened the door, the box is in front of him and the guy that shot him thought it was the other guy. And they shoot him like seven times. His fiance was telling me that as he was getting shot and running to the kitchen, he was mumbling some things. And that's been on my mind ever since. Was God gracious to help him? Did he have enough time to really get it right? No problem with the car, but the problem is, where is he at tonight? If his heart really wasn't right. Some you know we can't cut no corners. Either we're born again or we're not born again. We're saved or we're a sinner in here. Opportunity is right in front of you and I. But if we're not careful, we can miss it. This is why I believe that even Jesus speaks about the harvest, that it's right in front of you and I. There's a harvest, even of Lazarus out there, that if we're not careful, we're missing the opportunity. Doesn't matter what color, doesn't matter what background, God wants to help the people. He died to seek and save that which is lost here tonight. John 4, 35, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Lift up your eyes and look at the field for they are already white for harvest. In other words, he said there's an opportunity, but all we have to do is lift up our eyes. Matthew 9, 37 and 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were worried and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Verse 37, then he said to the disciples, the harvest is, plenty, is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest so God can help the people. You no, know, 1989, I got saved. Oh, good when I got saved. I fired up, burning me. Still burning today. 1996, I still remember to this day, and when I was putting the sermon together, this story came to my mind that back in 1996, pretty much, uh, pretty much got my attention. It's about a cat. I don't know if you guys remember, her name was Scarlett. Or read about this cat. On March 30, 1996, Scarlett and five kids were in an abandoned garage, which was allegedly used as a crack house in Brooklyn. When a fire started, New York City Fire Department responded to a call. David, the firefighter, noticed Scarlett carrying her kids one by one away from the garage. It goes on to say that her ears, her ears, her eyes, and her paws were completely blistered shut. Her coat highly singed. After saving the kittens, it was noted that she touched each of her kittens with her nose to ensure they were all there and all alive. 
She wasn't able to see them. And when she knew that they were all alive and well, then she collapsed unconscious once she determined her kittens were safe and sound. Here's a picture of Old Garden. Five times. The reason why they named her Scarlet after even the burn is because even it left scars on her. One by one, and I know you know it's a cat, and why is he using a cat? But this cat, even is a brave cat. Great mama cat. Probably braver than some of us in here. Some of us when we go knocking, we're scared of the chihuahuas. <laughs> Or we see signs or anything and we're so easily, amen, not to, amen, pretty much pursue the opportunity right in front of her. This mama cat, amen, wasn't missing the opportunity of saving her kittens. She goes in one by one. She rescues one. She rescues another. All the way to number five. It's a true story. So if you want to look at it, some of you are probably Googling it up already. The story goes on to say that every time you read this story, it never gets old. Can I say something? God help us when it gets old about helping the people. Come on, because yet there are so many Lazarus out there that desperately need hell. You know, it was blowing me away when I read it the other day again. It's been years since I haven't read it. And uh, right away, man, this, this uh, cat rescued, amen, her kids from a crack house. Come on. That's gospel. <laughs> I mean, well, that's gospel right there. I mean, you've been saved, amen, from a crack house in here. Lift up your hand. Besides me and AJ. <laughs> Praise God, amen. But look, today is because of a church that does care that does have a passion, that does have a, a, a vision for the lost in him. Say ye not four months and then comes the harvest. The harvest is here, church. The harvest is right in